All right. Thank you for joining me for these live internet studies. My name is Ariel bin Lyman Hanavi, and um, it's an hour and a half long study. In case you weren't aware, there are two main topics, and the first um, segment is entitled Eschatology, a Biblical Study of End Time Events, where we're looking through topics related to end time, which is a reference to um, like end time prophecy, um, book of Revelation type topics. We're actually working our way towards the book of Revelation. Eventually we'll get there, but we're going slowly topic by topic. Uh, and right now we've just crossed another milestone from topic 10 into topic 11, making a case for the pre-wrath view. So if that topic is of interest to you, then stick around for the next hour. After this, there will be another 30-minute segment entitled A Trinitarian Response to Biblical Unitarianism. It is an apologetic look at Trinitarian perspectives of God as uh, challenged by the non-Trinitarian perspective known as Biblical Unitarianism. So if you are interested in those types of topics, stick around past the first one-hour segment, and uh, the last segment is 30 minutes long. Okay, looking at the topic uh, list that we have in front of us, this is kind of a syllabus that I've been working from. We have 18 topics on, on um, the books at the moment, and we're now in topic 11, making a case for the pre-wrath view. So let me flash the particular views of rapture that I am entertaining uh, at the moment. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because that's what Topic 10 was all about, the rapture overview. Go back and listen to any of the previous videos uh, prior to this one. There are four basic foundational rapture views that are typically brought into a table discussion. There are more. There's really a fifth and a sixth one, but they're so minor that I'm not even really pursuing them. The four main views that most people are probably familiar with in church circles are the pre-trib rapture view, which if you take any particular timeline that assumes a seven-year um, final period of mankind's uh, history on planet Earth before God ushers in the Millennial Kingdom. So we're talking about a premillennial perspective. So there's a seven-year slice of history that is allotted for humans to have their final decision-making um, process. Are they going to decide on the Lord or are they going to decide on Satan? God lays out some events for these last seven years. Rapture, according to pre-trib view, takes place before the seven-year event kicks off. When will rapture happen? Could happen at any moment. It's signless. It's um, secret. It doesn't require any uh, anything that we should um, come before it. It could happen just at any moment, according to the pre-trib view. Scrolling down the list, we have the mid-trib view, which takes the seven same seven-year time frame. Cuts it right down the middle, like most of them do, in the midpoint, and says the rapture takes place right there in the middle. That's basically mid-trib rapture. As far as tribulation is concerned, this is the hard time that's going to happen to planet Earth, happen on planet Earth, and it's going to be persecution, it's going to be trouble. And most people define tribulation as um, a combination of natural and supernatural events. Pre-tribbers would probably, going back to looking at that list real quick, I apologize, pre-trib, as its name suggests, says that God is going to excuse Christians from the wrath, Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, right? And in this, um, not having Christians go through wrath, in other words, this, ex this um, exclusion from wrath, the pre-tribber combines the phrase wrath with tribulation, and thus says that the church must be raptured pre-tribulationally, prior to any wrath being poured out. Now I can move down to um, the mid-tribute, takes some of those same definitions of tribulation or, or wrath. At least on this chart, they say that we're not appointed to wrath, and therefore the, the rapture must take place prior to the wrath. But in this chart, it's shrunk down in ha half of its size. There's tribulation, and then there's God's wrath, which is great tribulation. All right. 
There's another view known as post-tribulation. This is a very popular view among organized religious denominations such as Catholics, Anglicans, Lutherans, um, Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, groups that have those similar kind of structures as other organized religions of those kind. Post-trib is also very popular among Messianic circles, um, people who reject dispensationalism. Uh, typically gravitate towards post-trib rapture type theology. Where is the rapture on this chart? It's the same seven-year time frame. In this version of the post-trib rapture, God's wrath runs the entire seven years. Thus, wrath and, and tribulation are the same um, across the entire seven-year spectrum. Rapture takes place at the far end, and it is synonymous, more or less, with the second coming at the far end of the 70th week or the seven years. There's another view, the one that I'm going to be talking about. It's called pre-wrath. This one takes that seven years, but it divides it up into essentially three segments. The first three and a half years is known as the beginning of sorrows. It's not even called tribulation anymore. And it's certainly not called God's wrath. It's called beginning of sorrows or the birth pangs is how the Greek word could be translated the phrase that Yeshua used in Matthew 24. The beginnings of sorrows or birth pains, either one. There's the midpoint, which is similar to all the other views. That's still there. And then we've got a, a, a time period that kicks off after the midpoint, known as the Great Tribulation. So there's no tribulation, per se. There's just the Great Tribulation. And then the segment after that, is called the day of the Lord, which is also labeled God's wrath. When is the rapture? It is post-tribulation. Maybe I should differentiate because of the equivocation on the word tribulation that's utilized by other views. We could say the pre-wrath rapture is post-great tribulation. That way I'm differentiating it from the view known as post-tribulation, so not to confuse. But the pre-wrath is post-great tribulation, but pre-God's wrath, pre-day of the Lord. So the rapture is in the middle. Now, this graphic shows the rapture happening three-quarters of the way into the 70th week, or halfway through the second half of the 70th week. But that doesn't mean that's where the pre-wrath is saying it will be. There's not an exact time frame. As we're going to find out, this is just for graphic purposes so that it's easier to read the labels. We don't know how, we don't know where the rapture could take place. We pre-wrathers could take place closer to the midpoint, could take place closer to the end where it says second coming. We don't know how long the tribulation will be. Okay, so that's where we are going in tonight's study. So let's jump right into it. What The resources that I'm going to be utilizing for this topic 11, for where I'm trying to make a case for the pre-wrath, as I've mentioned in previous teachings, and I'm just uh, recapitulating just a bit, there are two gentlemen who kind of function as the label, the fathers of the pre-wrath view. They are Marv Rosenthal and... Robert Van Campen, and the books that were released by these two Christian gentlemen who both have gone on to be with the Lord uh, since, they both passed away. Marv Rosenthal wrote the original book known as the Pre-Wrath Rapture, Pre Rapture of the Church. I'll flash a photo of it in post-production. It's kind of a white background with some dark blue, midnight blue writing on it. it has the word Pre-Wrath really prominent on the cover. So he wrote the original book, and then short that was back in the 80s, 1980s. And then shortly thereafter, Robert Van Campen put out his book known as The Sign. It's a black cover, a lot thicker, a lot more detail. It's got a photo of the planet Earth with uh, kind of like some um, lightning bolt striking it or something like that. So both of these books represent what I like to label as kind of the OG pre-wrath view, the original pre-wrath view as it was articulated by the two gentlemen that were, by the way, were, were friends of one another. They were not in competition with one another. There was a student-teacher relationship between them, but I'm not sure exactly which one was student, which one was teacher. But it doesn't really matter. Marv Rosenthal's ministry has survived today under the name Zion's Hope, and it's headed up by his son, David Rosenthal. There is a link to this ministry in the description of the videos below, so in case you want to follow it, I, I highly recommend it if you are curious about the pre-wrath view and you want to get it from one of the original pre-wrath perspectives, 
meaning from the perspective of someone who coined the term. As I've already mentioned, and as my good friend and study buddy in the Skype room uh, reminded me, the pre-wrath view is only new by name. But like I said, it's about 30 or 40 years old. It came around in the 1980s. But that's only the name, the label pre-wrath. The pre-wrath view is founded upon the original, um, what we call historic premillennial perspective, which has been shown historically to be the position held to by the early church fathers. Historic premillennialism. So we're talking about a perspective that in many ways is contrasted against the dispensational premillennial view. And details of the historic premillennialism include two sort of pillars to this perspective. And those pillars are that the church will face Antichrist in the tribulation, one. And two, that Christ will establish his kingdom on earth prior to the thousand-year millennium being set up. So he's going to return prior to the millennium and establish his kingdom. He's going to return and uh, set up his people, set up his kingdom. So we have a rapture that takes place pre-millennial, and we have the church facing off against the Antichrist, meaning it is in contrast to the pre-trib view. Remember, pre-tribbers do not believe that the church will face Antichrist. They believe that we will be gone prior to any of that happening. So by way of resources, I'm going to probably be referencing... Uh, Zion's Hope, Rosenthal's um, ministry, and I will probably utilize some of the information from the sign as well, the book that I uh, have on my bookshelf here and now sitting on my desk here. But beyond that, we have other teachers who have since been raised up after um, Rosenthal and Van Campen passed away to carry on the pre-wrath um, teaching in its original um, form, um, and those are the teachers that I try to hold to. Uh, the one that you're looking at right now on your screen is Alan Kirshner, uh, K U R S C H N E R, Alan Kirshner.com is his website. This is also linked in my description below, and he is also um, a, a, a very well spoken teacher. Um, he's got a lot of good details, he's an exegete, he's not really pastoral like, um, like the Rosendahls were, um, or Van Campen, who had a very pastoral heart. Uh, uh, Kirshner is just a stone-cold uh, Bible exegete, which I'm, I'm saying that as a compliment, so don't, don't take it the wrong way. But um, he's, he's got a lot of uh, good resources that are available, much of it free, and he's also putting together a very extensive um, uh, commentary in the book of Revelation, which is forthcoming. We're going to be using some of his resources. We're going to start with his. After that, we will eventually turn to a resource that is also available online, a free pre rats resource put together by a gentleman that I've mentioned earlier, and we looked at his blog in the past, Aaron Eggman. As far as I know, he's not a pastor. He's not an evangelist. He's not an author uh, who travels the world um, like some of the others that we've mentioned. He's just an ordinary Joe, just like you and me, as far as I can tell. Um, I reached out to him. He and I respond. He and I dialogued via email a few months ago. He gave me permission to use his pre-wrath resources, which are found online at prewrathresources.wordpress.com. They are linked in the descriptions of the video, so don't worry. And he is going to also help me. I mean, not on this YouTube channel, but I'm borrowing his resources. So his resources are going to help me um, make my case for the pre wrath view in time. And so we've got a lot of resources from his website um, that we're going to utilize. So um, so that's, that's partially where we're going. Uh, those, those are the only tabs that I've got um, bookmarked at the moment. They may grow in time. We'll see. I've also mentioned that there are a lot of new and upcoming pre rat teachers that are coming along. There is Charles Cooper that I'm going to be utilizing later on. Uh, he is a student of Van Kappen, if I remember. Charles Cooper is still um, running the ministry that I think Van Kappen left behind, the Sola Group. And um, we'll use, utilize some of his resources later. But here's the reason why I'm in mentioning this. As you as a Christian, study the pre wrath view right along with me, you're probably going to find some differing details 
that are articulated when it comes to the label pre-wrath. And so, if you find differing details, such as when the timing of the rapture happens, definitions on key terms, you can go ahead and put those in the comments of the videos, or you can shoot me an email directly. That's fine. Let me know. I'm only able to um, really uh, articulate the original pre-wrath view, which is the view that I hold to. So, I can't speak for all the different pre-wrath preachers that are coming up now these days that have a view labeled pre-wrath, but their timing might be slightly different than my own version of pre-wrath. So, um, I think discussion is healthy, and I think differences cause us to study more. So, I'm fine with that. I'm not seeking to divide, nor am I seeking to challenge them and say, hey, I'm right, you're wrong, get with the program. That's not what I'm trying to do either. I'm only simply trying to say that the original pre-wrath view that I was raised on comes straight from the two gentlemen who are the ones who introduced the term to Christianity as a whole. That would be Rosenthal and Van Campen. And so that's the perspective of pre-wrath that I'm describing when I say I'm trying to convince you of this view. So, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Let me change the view. Let's get a definition. What is pre-wrath? Let's use Dr. Alan Kirshner for this first exercise. This isn't very long, uh, by the way. Um, you can see the two books that I'm scrolling by on your screen um, that Dr. Kirshner has written, which are available on his website. The following description below is a brief overview for books on pre-wrath. Click on the images that we just saw. What is pre-wrath by Alan Kirshner? All right, so let's work our way through this. I think I'll try something novel, something that I always try but always fail at. Let's try reading down to the whole thing and then going back and explaining it after we read it. Let's try that. You think I can do that? Okay, let's do it. All right, here's what Dr. Kirshner has to say. Many of us were told that the church will be raptured out of here before the Antichrist's arrival. The Bible, however, teaches the church will first experience the Antichrist's great tribulation. Then, at some unknown day and hour, Antichrist's persecution will be cut short by the return of Christ to resurrect and rapture believers before the day of the Lord's wrath, hence pre-wrath. Kirshner continues, The purpose why the church will suffer greatly just before Christ's second coming will be for purging and purifying, separating out those who claim to have faith from those who actually possess true faith. But believers are promised deliverance before the day of the Lord's wrath. You guys following so far? Pre-wrath is a rapture that happens after the tribulation, but prior to the wrath of God. Accordingly, um, Kirshner says, there is an important biblical distinction between the events of the Antichrist's great tribulation and the day of the Lord's wrath. Let me interject here just briefly. This is one of the defining features of the pre-wrath view. The different um, understanding of the period known as great tribulation and the period known as day of the Lord or wrath of God. These are two separate and distinct periods, although the Antichrist himself, he is the architect and author of the Great Tribulation, he will not be destroyed after the Great Tribulation has run its course. So even though, as we're going to find out in the charts, Tribulation has a starting point and an ending point proper, it doesn't mean that the Antichrist himself is brought to an end at the same time that the tribulation is cut short by the day of the Lord. We'll get to those details in time, but it's important right now uh, simply that you know that uh, wrath of Satan and wrath of God are two differing kinds of wrath, and the church is only exempt from one of those wraths. They're not exempt from the other. Let's keep going. Antichrist's great tribulation will be directed against the church, followed by the day of the Lord's wrath directed against the ungodly. So there is, in a nutshell, the two time periods um, described. We'll read passages that detail this and why it's important for us to make this distinction. And this is important because of the way that these two time periods, tribulation and wrath, have historically been conflated with one another. For instance, let me go back to this chart and show you the pre-trib 
perspective. When we look at the pre-trib chart, we notice that the entire seven years is labeled God's wrath according to this model. But it's also labeled the, the um, tribulation and great tribulation, which means there's equivocation on the phrase wrath and tribulation. Those two phrases are um, conflated. They are um, equivocated against one another. There's some um, ambiguity as to what wrath is and what is tribulation. There's no differentiation between is it Satan's wrath, Antichrist's wrath, God's wrath. They're all mixed in together in this giant seven-year chart. And the only thing we can be agreed upon using this model is that Christians are exempt from the bad stuff. However, by comparison, when we get down into the pre-wrath model that we're going to be working with during this topic number 11, we see that it becomes very, very important using Scripture to differentiate the Great Tribulation, which is also referred to by the biblical term, not just Great Tribulation, but the wrath of Satan. The Great Tribulation spoken of by Jesus himself in Matthew 24. He uses that phrase, Great Tribulation, something to the effect of uh, Thalipsis Megale or something like that. Uh, tribulation is the word for, is the word, Greek word Thalipsis, the root word, and Mega or Megale is um, the uh, Greek word that uh, is translated into English as great. Um, Jesus coins this term. He uses this phrase about two or three times in the Bible. He uses it in the book of Revelation as well. And this great tribulation is spoken of in the book of Revelation as well, under the label in Revelation chapter 12 of the wrath of Satan, the wrath of the dragon who comes down. He has this great wrath. It even uses, the I think, one of the same Greek words, great, but then it uses a different Greek word for uh, uh, anger, or orge, orge in the Greek. So it's something like orge megale, uh, great wrath. But... This time period is distinguished from God's wrath, otherwise known as the Day of the Lord from the Old Testament. So that's part of the distinction that's being uh, drawn out by um, Kirshner here. So let's keep reading. Kirshner continues, Now regarding the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to be with Him, this is a quote from the Bible, obviously. This is Paul. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily shaken from your composure or disturbed by any kind of spirit or message or letter allegedly from us to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Remember, Paul had to write to the Thessalonian church because they were... They were being misled that they were already inside of the day of the Lord. They were already inside of the, um, the uh, they'd already gone into the tribulation and the day of the Lord was right around the corner. And there was some confusion. And so Paul had to set the record straight by giving them some chronological markers and some sequencing. He goes on to say, by let no one deceive you in any way for that day. This is Paul speaking. That day, and by context, that day is the day of the Lord. That day will not arrive until the rebellion comes and the man of lawlessness that is Antichrist is revealed, the son of destruction. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-3. to 